Welcome back to Learn SKN, and today we're going to continue looking at the May June 2019 Agriculture Science Paper for CSEC, Paper 2. So we're looking at May June 2019, and so we'll complete question 1, 2, 3, 4. And today we're going to be looking at question 5 and jump right into it. But before we do so, let me just let you know that you can like the video, subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell to know when Learn SKN drops another video for agriculture science. Also, in the description of this video, you'll find access to purchase as a agriculture study pack. The pack contains some past papers, maybe a textbook or two, uh, you know, some other things that would help you with studying, right? So you can also get that. It doesn't have any notes per se, but it has in the textbook and it has in the past papers, paper ones and paper twos, the blank ones and things like that. So like all of these things can help you getting ready for your exam. All right, so let's just jump into it right now then. Number five, figure two shows Farmer John's animal feeds on feeding on forage, right? So the question asks, identify the method of method being used to forage, to feed forage to the animals. So what method is being used to feed these animals? And of course, there's a whole lot of different uh, grazing methods and feeding methods for animals. But the best one here is zero grazing. So the answer for this one would be zero grazing refers to the cutting, chopping and feeding of forage crops to ruminant ho housed in pens or stalls. Right? The animals feed on grass without having to graze, hence the term zero grazing. So this one is an example of zero grazing. They don't have to go out in the field. You bring the grass or the legumes or whatever forage to the animal. So that's zero grazing. One easy mark right there. Then the question part to ask. State one advantage and one disadvantage of using the method shown in figure two to feed forage to animals. So name one advantage and one disadvantage of zero grazing. And so, of course, we're going to look in the textbook again. And they are outlined right here. Advantages, disadvantages. And so we have advantages. Makes efficient use of forage. That's one. Two, there is a high level of animal production. Three, herbage is not trampled or fouled by animals. So I don't want to uh, mess on it. And its advantage, forage can be harvested at its most succulent, palatable, and nutritious stage. So they only asked for one, but I gave you four. Now disadvantages right here. Especially special machinery and equipment for harvesting, transporting, and chopping is needed. There are high costs related to setting up and maintaining housing for animals, the machinery, and the equipment. There's an increase in labor costs, bedding material for the animal, and manual disposal. The number of animals reared is restricted. It is suitable only for small herd of ruminants. And so you have the advantages and disadvantages of zero grazing. Then the question asks now, so there's two reasons why it is important for Farmer John to include forage when feeding his animals. So why should you use forage when feeding your animals? So this question, so just two reasons why it is important for Farmer John to include forage when feeding his animals. This question is simply asking you, why is it, why, why food important? Why ration important? Why, why, why should I feed my animals? That's what it, in a sense asking you. And so we feed our animals for four main reasons. And if you jump to our textbook, we'll see the reasons here. Livestock feed, known as feedstuff, provide nutrients for energy, growth, development, maintenance, production, and reproduction. So all those are reasons why it's important to feed the animals their forage. Forage includes things like grass and legumes, th those plant-based base, uh, food stuff. That's forage. So most of them are fed to ruminants, such as your, your, your sheep, your goat, your cattle. They normally feed on forage crops, like your legumes and your grass and those kind of things. So forage is very important because of its, of its nutritional value that it adds to the animals, because all of this is needed for the animal's overall well-being, for its maintenance, its production, reproduction, is for energy, for growth, for development. You can't just feed animals uh, supplements all the time. You have to feed them actual forage food because it's important for them for their overall development. So don't just stick to maybe yeah, you might find some some mash or something out there. Don't just stick to those kind of things. 
The animals need real forage to help their, their system maintain itself and things like that. Alright, so that's very important. That is why forage is important for the animals. Okay, good. So two reasons why it is important to include forage when feeding animals. We answered that. Next question asks, a farmer who practices rotational grazing observes the parasite infestation is well controlled in his cattle. So a farmer who practices rotational grazing observes that parasite infestation is well controlled in his cattle. Now the question asking you, so there's three ways in which rotational grazing helps to control the level of parasite infestation. Okay, so this one again is a nice application question. So it says, suggest three ways in which rotational grazing helps to control the level of parasite infestation. So let's look at what rotational grazing is first and foremost. So rotational grazing, yeah, the pasture, pasture, the pasture is subdivided into into a number of paddocks. In this case, they have six to eight paddocks. Each is systematically grazed in sequence, with the ruminants being moved from one paddock to another. The stocking rate is usually high, 20 to 25 cows per hectare. Each paddock is grazed for three to seven days, depending on the stocking rate and the herbage growth. And after time, the paddock is rested and the animals are moved to another paddock. The system continues until the last paddock has been grazed and the cycle is then repeated. When the paddocks are not being grazed, by the un are not being grazed, they undergo pasture management. So we get that out of the way. So how can that help with parasite infestation? Now, first and foremost, now, one reason, because it's rotational grazing, it doesn't give the parasite enough time to settle, to settle in and affect the herd directly. What do I mean by that? You can take one, you remember I said three to seven days. So by the time the parasite comes about, right, you're already moving your animals from one paddock to a next, to a next, to a next. So let's say that the, the parasite is in paddock one. Before they can establish themselves, the parasite can establish themselves, you would have already moved the animals to a next paddock, a fresh paddock. Before it establishes itself on that paddock, it moved to a next paddock. And a next, and a next, and a next. So then the animal, the parasite would have no chance to properly establish itself to a level that becomes so problematic because you're constantly moving the animals. So that's one way. Because you're moving the animals, the parasite has no chance to get you know, to a level where it's problematic to the, the animals and hard to control, that's one. Another reason here is that, I mean, some of the parasites might be seasonal, right? They might come around, maybe wet season, dry season, that kind of thing. So based on the, the rotation and the size of the paddock and things like that, it might very well mean that by the time you rotate from, from paddock one to six and one again, the season would have changed and the parasite might have gone out of season in a sense, because some might strive best in, you know, damp conditions. So might strive best in, you know, dry conditions, but I will go to the damp conditions. So by the time, because you're constantly moving the animals, the season would pass by, and so the parasite would not get a chance to establish itself properly, because the season, by the time the animals come back around, the season might have been out, and the level, the, 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 the level of the parasite would be so low that it doesn't really impact the animals or the herd like that. So that's another reason how rotational grazing can help, because it caused, it, as time, it allows time to go by, before the parasites can actually establish themselves properly based on the season and the time of year and things like that all right so by the time the time comes around again parasite gone things like that so that's the next one that's a, that's, a, that's a second reason another way in which rotational grazing can help to you know control the level is because you uh you have multiple options in terms of grazing grazing paddocks now the farmer can allow the animal to eat the, the grass down to a certain level because the parasites normally dwell further down, closer to the roots, maybe two, three inches above the, two or so inches above the soil level. So allow the animals to go when the grass is nice and high, eat it down to a certain level, then take them out and put them in another paddock before they can reach down to 
a level that they consume the parasites and the eggs and things like that. So they don't have to go and graze all the way down because they have options. It is not like they, 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 they're just one product and that's it. You have multiple products and so you don't allow the animal to graze too deep, like right down to the stub and ingest the parasite eggs or larvae, anything like that. You allow it to eat for until you're a certain level, still high enough, and then they go to the next one. Also, in rotational grazing, there's a period of rest, right? So, when you when you don't have to use the paddock back to back to back to back, they actually said there's a period of rest where you can just let it rest and undergo partial management when it's not being used or grazed. So that period of that that that, that down period can be used to allow the cycle of the parasite to from to spawn from egg, larvae, adult, and die. And then you know, based on whatever time of the year is, you put the animals back in. So those are all ways in which rotational grazing helps to control the level of parasite infestation so again it it allows for because of the movement it doesn't allow the animal the, the parasite to establish itself at a high level in the animal that's one because of the movement it causes time to go by you know the time of the year the summer the wind the summer the season to pass by so that means that the life cycle of the parasite might have gone by before you reach back into that paddock. Next one again is that you it allows you to allow the animals to feed just to a certain level. Don't go right down to the root or you know just little don't go down to the stub where the parasite normally dwell because you know they only reach that, that level. So you allow them to feed to a safe height and then you move them to a the next paddock to continue feeding. And of course, you allow the land to rest and and follow, or you manage the land. And during that rest period, the parasite might end up dying off, or you treat the land. You treat the land accordingly. You might want to treat the the the, the paddock while it's being not used by the animals. So any of those, you, you outline any of those, and you get your tree marks for that one. All right. So the last one for this question: During the rainy season, it is easy for the farmer for farmers to obtain forage to feed the animals. However, in a dry season, many farmers experience difficulty finding high-quality forage to feed their animals. So just two methods farmers can implement in order to conserve forage for use in the dry season. Okay, and so this is forage conservation methods. And you have three of them out there in the textbook. One is deferred grazing for sure. Then you have hay making. And then you have silage making. Right, so you have silage and you have hay making. So silage is a pasture grasses, legumes, and other crops that have been conserved or stored in silos. So you cut the grass, you put them to ferment under maybe a tarpaulin or in a silo or whatever. You put them to ferment. And so when time comes and you need it, you can go and retrieve it to feed the animals when they don't really have anything else there to consume. So that's one. And here, of course, you go cut the, 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 the grass, put them to dry in bales or stacks. So that when time comes, you can go and just feed the animal those stocks. And you have them right here. There are three major forage conservation techniques. Hay making, silage making, deferred grazing. And so the question simply asks you to suggest. And you know, because of the lines, you know, you can suggest with a sentence or two. And so hay making, that's where you take the young grass and you cut them, put them to dry, and you store them for a later date. Silage, that's what I said before. You cut the grass, put them to ferment or in a silo to store, so they're going to be nice and succulent still. They're not going to be dried. The silo grass is not going to be dried. It's going to be nice and succulent still, and you can feed the animals. And of course, you have deferred grazing that we looked at earlier, where you simply do not put, you leave a paddock just for literally a rainy season, a rainy day, or in this case, a dry, a dry day. So you don't allow the animals to, to graze in that paddock until later on, when it is absolutely necessary. And so any of those would be the conservation methods for forage. And just like that, just like that, we knock off question five for the May-June 2019 Agricultural Science CSEC paper two. All right, just like that. So that's it for now. You know what to do. Like the video, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you know when Learn SKN drops another video for agriculture science all right thanks for watching thanks for listening